welcome to Murphy and Company. And I have a wonderful guest keeping me company today, mm. and that's Ted Hartley. Wow. And I, I have been thinking about how to introduce Ted. He is a farm boy, a pilot, a military man, an actor, a producer, <laughs> a director, a businessman, a painter, a poet, and a wonderful, loyal friend. So it's wonderful to have my friend Ted Hartley here with us today. He lives here in East Hampton. Yeah. And tying him down to find a time he could be here, because he's all over the world producing now uh, Broadway shows and in London, and he'll tell us about that. But well, well, I'd just like to stop the show right here, because <laughs> I'm just happy as I can be. I'll just take this little port and take it home. <laughs> Thank all you, right. Michelle. That's really lovely. Well, I've been trying to get you here to our Humble Station, when, when you this, are the head of RKO Pictures, and what do you think? But let me tell you, you this going on, humble eh? little, it's pretty impressive. I've been in a lot of television stations. Yeah. First of all, I feel more home at home here. I love being part of this community. Yeah. And then secondly, this is pretty impressive, even though all the clocks don't run and, the, uh, <laughs> and all, joke. Of, all of that stuff. This, I think that's a joke. Uh, do you want to show that? Can we look at that? No, we can't. <laughs> Any, it's a great joke because they have uh, they have six clocks here: uh, Sag Harbor, Wainscot, East Hampton, Montauk, Amagansett, and the Springs. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't tell the same the same time. Right. So that's <laughs> just, just to show different. you how how different we all are. <laughs> and I have to tell you that I met Ted actually in Manhattan at a beautiful gala when his for Guild Hall. Yes, his wonderful wife of many, many years. Dina Merrill was being honored a Lifetime Achievement Award and also our theater at Guildhall. Right. The John Drew Theater. It's, well, not the theater, actually the whole theater the complex. complex yeah. That is to the makeup, the, the green room, the, the box office, all of that is under one kind of shell called the Dina Merrill Pavilion. Yes. The John Drew Theater is part of that. It's just part of that. And just it's changed yeah. when you go over there and you go backstage and you see those colossal that's dressing all, rooms and everything is, is you guys. Yeah. That's all so, Dina Merrill. <laughs> that's when I met Ted. This was three or four years ago, and we hit it off and had such a good time when, when you were there helping to receive her award. And I tell you, it's not a bad, there, you can't have a bad time out here. No. I mean, I love being part of this community. It's just yes. yeah. it's so yummy. And, you know, it, it must hearken you back to your beginnings in Iowa as a uh, young farm boy. Because there's farms everywhere here. We hope they'll stay. We've got to stay. Yeah. Where are we going to get our pumpkins? Where are we going to get our corn? We've we, we got to have it. And have our vistas. So tell us a little bit about your beginnings. You grew up as a very small boy. Not having it easy, if I read right. Tough yeah. times, but happy times when you were very, very little. Well, first of all, I actually, I used to be, try to pretend I wasn't from Iowa. Because oh. my image of somebody with corn seed coming out of their <laughs> hair and, and talking funny like this. And saying That's that, your charm, though. That little, <laughs> you can't take that away. And it's part of your charm. Well, thank God we've got some. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, but I loved... I loved being a boy in the fields, and I, I drove a tractor when I was six years old, and it's just like great memories. But as you say, there were some mixes. And um, I remember when I was four, and my father, on one Sunday afternoon, we had a picnic out in some woods near this area. That we called them the 56th Street Woods. And there was an area in the middle of all these trees where you could spread a blanket out. Mm. and Four years old, and I went out with, I guess my mother was there, although I don't remember her, and my father, and somebody took a picture that I saw later on. There's my father on the blanket, spread out, coat and tie, oh, on a Sunday afternoon man. picnic. As a farmer, a gentleman farmer. Oh, well, they, you dress those guys up on Sunday. Oh, yeah. Very religious home? Mm, religious, probably the wrong word, devout is mm -hmm. meaning a lot of respect for religion and church, mm -hmm. but there wasn't very much genuflecting and uh, crossing. You know, mm -hmm. It wasn't, 
wasn't formal that way, but there was, there was a sense, and I think I carry it through my life, mm -hmm. of a sense that there's something going out, out there that's bigger than we are individually. And there's a force, and mm -hmm. maybe you can access it. Maybe there's a, you're part of that. And maybe you, all you do is get to contribute to it. But it's part of it. It's and that, became, that was very important to me as a child. And was your grandmother part of your life at that point? Not yet. Not yet. OK, because I know she was very important to you. Very. Yes. Uh, Meliora Ringwald. Isn't that a great name? We'll talk about her later. And were you the firstborn? I was the firstborn. OK. Actually, there were only two of us, so I was the primary born. Yeah. But anyhow, this Sunday was so, I can see it. It still burns out of my memory, and the whole feeling of being with my father in the blanket, and this great sun coming through the woods, and the funny papers, and they were funny. They're Dick <laughs> Tracy. And it the was funny all papers. Fun. The funny papers were really funny. I remember all that with joy. And then a week later, um, my father and my mother had gone up. They'd kind of a mysterious trip. They'd just left and gone up to Rochester, Minnesota, uh, which is north of Iowa. And there's something called the Mayo Clinic there, which is a pretty famous world medical thing. Oh, yeah. There wasn't much medical in Iowa at that time. Mm -hmm. So they, you went to, to the Mayo Clinic. Oh, and you were only four. I was four. And I, this was a week after the picnic. Mm -hmm. And they were gone. And so we were with the babysitter in we had a dining room. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was some kind of feeling about the house I didn't understand, strange. Mm -hmm. The babysitter was having dinner with me and trying to keep me quiet and entertained. Mm -hmm. And then I heard something out through the house. And I was expecting the family, to, mom and daddy, to come back. Mm -hmm. And so I got up and started running out. And the babysitter going after tried to bring me back yeah. because she knew. Yeah. But I went, I broke away. Broke through the big velvet curtains that in the Middle West we used to have to shut the rooms off oh, yes. so you didn't Keep have to heat the whole house. Yes, I understand. Right. Out into the darkness of the living room and the hallway at the far end, and there was like a statue. It was with no other light in the room. There was this tall figure, which I recognized as my mother, un, uh, unmoving mm -hmm. and, and unexpressive, seeming whatever. And I rushed up and I grabbed her, I remember, and pulled her over to the sofa. And I said, what did you bring me? What did I get? What, 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 what goodies? What, what did I a new toy. And my toys, what did you get? And then I said, where's daddy? Yeah. And she said, daddy's gone away on a long trip. A long trip? Yeah. When's, he, when's he coming back? not coming back for a long time. And with that, the maid came in and grabbed me, pulled me out. I didn't see my mother again for 10 days. And I did not know really what was going on. Yeah. The next day, the house was full of strangers. Mm -hmm. Bringing women food and. Well, I, whatever they brought, but the <sighs> women were nine feet tall. Yeah. They all wore this black veils. And oh, God. Uh, they would pat my head, and they didn't know quite what to say to me. And yeah. this is my house. Right. What are, you, what are all these what people this? doing here? And Maybe, dressed uh, in black and veils, frightening. It's just weird. Yeah. And I wandered out the street, and one of the guys in the neighborhood came up to me, and he said, um, uh, uh, "Your father's dead." And I said, oh, "You're wrong. He's gone away on a trip. My mom and mother told me so. No, no, my dad told me your father's dead. Get out of here." And I took a swing you at were him. Probably and a tough little kid. Not I didn't like any, to have. I didn't like to be bullied. I, no. So I never let that happen. You never let it happen. I like that. But now I had a problem I couldn't deal with, mm -hmm. but I knew that my father was someplace, and it was very mysterious, and nobody wanted to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It had to be dangerous. It had to be awful. It had to be terrible. Mm -hmm. and so I remember standing in front of. A, a big window at one end of the living room, looking out at the sky and trying to get some, to hold myself together. I yeah. And I made a deal with God. 
And I said, I don't know what you've done with my father, but if, if you will never let whatever you're, has happened to him, to dad or whatever, happen to me, I'll be perfect. And I'll make it even better, God. Not only be perfect, I'll never tell anybody so you don't have to do this for anybody else. So I locked in. So I could never talk to anybody about it. So I had this deal that I locked in. But I had to cover myself. So I had a lot of superstitions, the words I wouldn't say, and other things just to be sure. And when I went to bed at night, I remember I would stretch my arms out to the side and spread my legs, and I would grip them as tightly as I could Oof. until I was so asleep I couldn't hold on anymore, and I'd mm. still say, even you were asleep, hold on to them. And the idea was that if yes. somebody came in and thought I was dead, they wouldn't be able to get me in a box. They wouldn't be able to get me in a oh coffin. Oh, my God. So they'd have to wake me up, and, oh. and I could say, no, 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 I'm alive. <clears throat> so it was that terrified thing yeah. of a childhood that I was going to die, and and I wouldn't be really dead, but people would think I was. Yes. Uh. Oh, I see. So you thought you could freeze I into could, that while right. you were asleep, so right. it would be safe to sleep. Right. So they, was there a coffin brought into the house, do you think? I don't do you remember? think so. I don't. You don't think so, but somehow you had that I think I, I think everybody agreed there was a, a tacit conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Four-year-old kid can't handle this. Yes. So yep. there's nothing mm -hmm. happening here. Right. It's just your father's going around wrong. Excuse the long dresses and the mm -hmm. veils and all that. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with anything. Right, right. <clears throat> Gaslighting you in a way which is crazy making, of course. Yeah, it, and it, you it, had to... Confusion. Very, and, and no one to talk to. Here, no one to talk to. God now is the best chance I've got, but I've already said I'm not going to talk to anybody about that mm -hmm. in order to keep yeah. that. So I would break so that, but I'm lost. So Now you skip ahead 20 years. Okay. Now I'm... So you're 26. 24. Yeah, 24. And now I'm flying the navies, naturally. Yeah. What, what would Perfect. you do if you were afraid of death? You would fly jets off a carrier. Oh, yeah. Naturally. Right. <laughs> You've got wings out there, no coffin here. Probably the most dangerous part of the military in a way, but also the most elite. So I was very proud to be. In and you wrote an essay that, allowed you to get your training. Oh, well, that and was... We're going to jump ahead at one of our next interviews about your grandson who wrote uh, an essay, which I find well, fascinating. Some stories, kid. Yeah. So anyway, you became a pilot, which was no easy feat. You had to well, be yeah, and that's chosen. probably going through flight training and all that. That's another mm -hmm. story. But mm -hmm. now... Okay. I'm past that. All right. Because now I still... Have, the most important thing in my life was the death of my father. I felt it through me all it wasn't a day go by that I wondered whether God was working and some place down in my subconscious still feeling this pull and this, this fear that I'd never really from dealt being with. Four years old, that's still Operating. with you very much. By the way, you have some four year old stuff that's still working with you. Oh, it's just me, mine hit me every day. Believe me, I do. So now I'm flying the Navy's first supersonic aircraft. On an aircraft, going to an aircraft carrier is a little bit crazy because I'm not sure I can handle this. Mm -hmm. But I was the last guy to come aboard the squadron, Quonset Point, Rhode Island, the DF-73. And the last guy to come aboard was a guy named McDonald. <clears throat> he was a shiny new, he just had his wings, and his uniform looked like he just took it out of a box, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. crumpled and wooly but nice. And, but he was a really nice guy, and I, I liked him from the first moment I... Mm -hmm. So I mean, he had a crew cut and he had a smile that kind of went like that, a bit of a kind of a loopy smile. And he was cocky, mm -hmm. but he was a fun guy. And he hit and, it off. And <laughs> he kind of he got the idea that I was like a little nervous, a little mm -hmm. uncomfortable with all this and trying to brave it through. And he kind of kid me along. And because he turned out to be a perfect aviator, it gave me confidence. And it was my friendship with McDonald that said, I can handle this. And there's that perfection that you had promised, and he was embodying Well, he at it. least, yeah, he was going to take me there. He wasn't yeah. God, but he was. Yeah. Uh, we came to, there's a thing called an FCLP. Do you want to hear all this? Oh, I, I think it's fascinating, and I think everyone watching is, they can't wait for the next installation. <laughs> I mean, forget Breaking Bad, and, well, not that I'm comparing it, but this is going to be a series, I told you. 
Go ahead. So it's fascinating. Before, You're fascinating. Before you can go to the carrier mm -hmm. on in any Navy aircraft, and supersonic or not, and uh, you have to be you have to qualify on land first, and they have what they call FCLPs, field landing carrier practice, and they take a, a deserted field and they draw a big white outline on the runway mm -hmm. that's the size of an aircraft carrier, mm -hmm. and they draw lines across for the arresting wires, and they put a box at the end of it for the landing signal officer, the LSO, to stand with his flags and his guns, and. The landing signal officer, the guy, decides whether you get aboard or not. Nobody else. Not the captain, not the admiral, not the squadron commander. It's all on the LSO. He's responsible for the safe landing, safe conduct of the plane the last half mile before it gets to the ship until it lands. Very important guy. Mm -hmm. Nobody questions the LSO. Why? One guy. Oof. So they, we'd have this LO, and we each had, we'd do, had to do 100 landings that the LSO approved. A hundred. Before yes. we were allowed to go, even go to the, the practice carrier. Yes. Because it's dangerous. Mm hmm So it took me about 107, 108 tries to get my hundred. And I was pretty still good. pretty good. Yeah. I was still up in the upper numbers. I mm -hmm. wasn't all bad. Mm -hmm. uh, McDonald that. got a hundred in 101 tries. He, I mean, the, like the older guys in the squadron, all of the 28, 29-year-old guys, really old guys. Yeah. McDonald was acing all of them. Was he your age, 24? He was younger. He was a year Even younger, younger, right. And he was hot. And he was cocky, but he was good. And, and so that night, uh, after the, he'd uh, gotten it, we went into the officer's club bar, and I was saying, McDonald, you aced it. My God, nobody's ever had a score 100 out of 101. And he said, yeah, damn it. That damn LSO was taken out of me. I said, I should have had 100. He just was playing with my head. And I said, McDonald, LSO doesn't play with your head. He doesn't care about you. No. It's not personal. Yeah, right. He's not going to do something personal to you. His, yeah. that's his job is to uh -huh. get us aboard. He was not playing with your head. Congratulations, 100. Mm -hmm. McDonald took his glass. And he threw it down on the bar and broke it. Okay. He's and I realized he was yeah. a perfectionist and that there was that one weak point, is that yes. he had to be perfect I and he was not that. going to take any challenge. Yes. And, and the he, temper issue of handling it that way. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next day we went to the carrier. It was the Tarawa, USS Tarawa, which uh, after World War II, probably the Korean War, mm -hmm. was very active. Now was less active, and they used it as a training carrier, and would go up and down the Atlantic coast, and sometimes down into South America. But you basically used it to qualify on board before you went to the big stuff. Okay. So now we flew off from Quonset Point, went over Block Island, headed out to the Tarawa, 100 miles out at sea, waiting for us. We, uh, I was in the first division, the skipper's division. Mm -hmm. The skipper, his wingman. Then me, then McDonald. I got McDonald my wing. That made me feel really good. So you can be okay. Yeah, yeah. Got him in your back pocket. Yeah, I should say. He's gonna, yeah. I'll, I'll be great. Yeah. So now we. I'd want him too. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> want wants a McDonald. Me. Yeah. So there we are. Now I'm flying with him and upwind, and you go by the carrier in formation. Mm -hmm. um, formation. Going, oh, what is that? Yeah, it's really fun. You know, you, fun. I the carrier like down there, the you're ground. about. But, yeah. You're about 1,000 feet, you know, oh. pretty high. The carrier's down there, and you go by in formation as a kind of salute to the carrier, like mm -hmm. we're coming aboard. Mm -hmm. You go on a forward of the carrier, or mm -hmm. ahead of the carrier, mm -hmm. and then you break off one by one mm -hmm. and come around on the downwind side, single file, and about uh, 10 seconds behind each other. So now you've got this line coming up to the carrier, when you get the carrier under your wing, yes. uh, the, the lip of the carrier, the, the fan tail as they call it, mm -hmm. then you start your gradual turn, and lose 50 feet, and come around and line up for your landing. Mm -hmm. As you come up the groove, you're now in the control of the LSO. And so the LSO is watching you come in, he's watching you, guiding the ball, he's talking to you if he needs to, but he doesn't mm -hmm. really talk a lot. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the point where you 
about ready to get the ship, he does one of two things. He either cuts you, which is, he's got flags. He either cuts you, which means, this is the cut, that means you're landed. Or you the hook. Yeah, with the, the, the hook down, the, the drops from the back of the airplane. Okay, I was talking showbiz, but. Yeah, well, it's a different. <laughs> okay, that's years later. No, well, yeah, there's a different kind of hook. Yeah. We all have hooks. <laughs> and that's so, the poet coming out. Okay, that's later <laughs> too. All right. <laughs> now, uh, so there we are, and and uh, he's talked us all in. Skipper got aboard. His wingman got aboard. Mm -hmm. I got aboard. I got the number three wire, which is the one you want. Yeah. And I taxied on up. Now McDonald's the next guy to come aboard. I wanted to see my buddy come aboard. I jumped out of my aircraft. They put it on the elevator, and I started back on the on the, uh, the, the, deck, the corner deck, the catwalk as they call it, toward the fantail, toward the back of the ship, to watch McDonald come in and it's a McDonald, you know, he's a hundred for 101, this is gonna be cool. So he, he, is he, he's coming in and it looks just great and the LSO's about, I think, ready to cut him. And at the last minute he waves him off, the, all of the rockets go off and the guns fire. And McDonald has been waved off, meaning not allowed to land. So now he has to go all the way up the front of the ship, get in line again behind mm -hmm. the second and third division, mm -hmm. tail in Charlie. Mm -hmm. And McDonald, the perfect aviator, is yeah. now last in line. The second and third division come in. They all land mm -hmm. one way or another, mm -hmm. except one guy gets waved off. Mm -hmm. So now it's that guy mm -hmm. and McDonald. McDonald's coming now, come in for his second try. No problem, I mean, McDonald, mm -hmm. he'll ace this one. Yeah. So I was now back with the LSO at the Fantail. I could see the LSO watching very carefully. And uh, as he came to the spot, I could see him go, and he waved him off again, second wave off. And that hadn't happened with anybody else? No, two wave offs is really unusual. Unprecedented. And now you yeah. have a little bit of a fuel problem coming That's what up. I was going to ask. And also, you get three wave offs, you go back to the beach. You probably won't make the Mediterranean cruise of the squadron. You have to go back through training again. Mm -hmm. There's a Were lot of. Were they giving him a hard time, do you risk. think? Is what? Were they giving him a hard time? No, no, not at all, on the no? contrary. No, no, he's the perfect day beater. I see. And, they were just and giving they, him a challenge. Now he's coming around the third time. He has to go all the way up. The, on, now he's all alone. Mm -hmm. You've got two destroyers, three uh, helicopters, mm -hmm. 5,000 people on this carrier, mm -hmm. all waiting for McDonald to get aboard. And the, the a gunner's mate standing next to me said, we better get out the, the, the damn guns. We're going to have to shoot this guy down to get him aboard. He's talking about McDonald. Oh, my. And so now this is the perfectionist. Yeah, yeah. McDonald's coming around. This is going to be it. If he doesn't make this mm -hmm. one, he's going back to the beach. And life will be different for him. No problem. It's McDonald, remember. Yeah. He's going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So he comes in over again. He's right in the right spot. The cross hairs, I'm sure, are crossed. And he comes in, and he gets the cut down. And the LSO, just before he was landing, yeah. said, Donald, I've had to wave you off twice mm -hmm. because you're pulling your nose up as you're, mm -hmm. as you're coming in just before mm -hmm. I'm going to cut. If you pull your nose up, you're going to float over the mm -hmm. carrier. You're going to hurt yourself and everybody else. I can't cut you if you float, so don't. Hold your nose up. Just relax. Let it mm -hmm. sink down. Mm -hmm. The plane will land itself. Mm -hmm. Now McDonald's coming in. Now he gets the cut. And as I'm watching there, his nose goes straight over. And he smashes in his nose wheel into the deck. And I'm thinking about how he smashed the glass at the bar the night yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. It's the same smash. He hit his nose wheel, compressed the strut in the nose wheel, threw the plane up in the air so it's now vertical over the ship, mm -hmm. can't fly anymore. Mm -hmm. And as I'm watching it, it goes over the port <sighs> side of the ship and down to the water. <sighs> and I rushed to the side, and by the time I got there, there was just bubbles. Supersonic aircraft hitting the water nose down is going to go straight down. Mm -hmm. Choppers come around, destroyers come around, mm -hmm. the ship has to go on. Mm -hmm. They stay there to mm -hmm. hunt and pick up any piece they can. Maybe they can do something, some miracle. Some miracle, yeah. But McDonald is gone. He's gone. It's like picnic on a Sunday afternoon Isn't with it? my dad. Isn't it? 
suddenly now I was shaky. Of course. And because the Navy works 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. uh, the Navy stops, never stops. Never stops, yeah. So they called me. I was the next one out. Oh my, my hands were shaking. I was now they're going to launch me, and I, I knew that if I didn't come, I'd yeah. probably I'd go to psychologists and they'd go. Oh, I, mean, I see. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to so get my airplane. So you can show your fear, and, and there's no room for that. No. Nope. No room for emotion. We're always yeah. in wartime status. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I went mm -hmm. out the airplane. I checked the thing. I and I can't fly. I shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. Climbed up in it at my controls, and I thought, how the hell am I going to get out of this? I can't mm -hmm. fly this airplane. Oh, God, there is in the, in the F-9, F-6, mm -hmm. and most airplanes, everything on a carrier has something that's called a throttle guard. Mm -hmm. It's a single metal finger that sticks up. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the catapult, because you get all these G-forces getting thrown off at a basketball court, really, really, going from zero to 140 miles an hour, uh, you, everything gets oh. plastered back. So you, That's when you see like faces with yeah. the skin, you know, yeah. And if you're not careful, your hand comes with it and then you don't oh. have any power. Oh my God. So you wrap the you throttle around the, the little thing. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, rev up engines, check your mm -hmm. engines. If you get to 100%, then that's all, and then off you go. I was not ready to go. So I put my finger between the throttle and the throttle guard and ran it up all the way. It went to 96%, but it wouldn't go beyond that. My finger was in the way. So now I could call the bridge and say, the plane isn't checking out. I got to go. I'm going to save my life, and I'll save everybody's life, and I'm out of here. Oh. And I was about to call the bridge and tell them the plane wouldn't fly, and I had to go. Yeah. And I pulled my finger away, and I thought, if I do this, mm -hmm. I'm going to remember it all my life. So I was sitting there saying, I can't. I can't fly, but I can't not fly. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Plane captain was in charge of the plane. Mm -hmm. The mechanic, enlisted man, came up on the wing. He, was, he, he and I were kind of buddies in a way. Mm -hmm. And of course, you remember I have this big hat and, and oxygen mask, and all you can see are my eyes and my yeah. goggles are halfway down, so not much visible. So he couldn't see that I was scared. And he kind of he tapped me on the head and said, you're going to have a great flight, lieutenant. And he put his hand on my gloved hand, mm -hmm. and by doing it, it was just enough to move the throttle forward. It went to 100%, and he said, you're good to go, sir. Have a great <laughs> flight. And, and guess what? They put, We're out of time. <laughs> just in time. Anyhow, I launched. You launched. I and launched, went up, and joined it, and I came back, and, and I never in my life, ever since then, ran away from fear. So thank you, McDonald. And thank you, Daddy. <laughs> and next time we're going to hear your grandmother <laughs> saying, which is very much right, about not right. running away from fear. So this is installation one. This is called the Ted Hartley series. <laughs> Come back. So much more to hear from this brilliant man. You're the best.